day. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane and have Sean in studio. This is a show about what matters most in life our mind, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I'll bring you the latest research about young people who are hooked on their smartphone, maybe at an increased risk for depression and loneliness. And then I will speak to Dr. Nick Agin, an award-winning executive coach who utilizes positive psychology and Buddhist psychology together to encourage personal and organizational growth. You can call us to speak with me or Dr. Nick Egan um, on the studio line, 951-922-3532. We'd love to hear from you. And be sure to listen to my podcast on iTunes and Stitcher and actually SoundCloud also and share it with your friends. Um, give me a comment, um, uh, put a thumbs up and uh, let your friends know to become part of the podcast. We'll be right back with the tip of the week. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the Awareness Integration Model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. We're back with tip of the week. Now this week, I've been working on the state of giving up. Yeah, giving up. I'm sure at times you've experienced the concept of resignation and giving up. When we, when what is in front of you is not what you desire or can handle or tolerate, and yet have no other alternatives. So when you think that you have tried all that you can, and it appears that you have no other option nor the energy to deal with it, take a moment and see what the circumstances were when you wanted to give up versus the circumstances when you moved ahead and either found the solution or just accepted the situation and therefore dealt with it differently. So reflect upon your internal process of thinking, feeling, and behaving. And when you just want to give up versus when you move ahead and handle all that's going on. The state of giving up appears to be an internal state where you don't like what's going on and try multiple times to change it but you can't succeed and therefore you give up trying. This usually comes with a feeling of defeat, failure, regret, shame, sadness, fear, or anger. What if you had another outlook? How about the reality is as is. You don't like it. You try to change it. It doesn't change. Then you accept it as is and begin dealing with it from choosing this reality in front of you and make the best of your relationship with what is in front of you. No, reality stays the same over time. Circumstances change over time. So accepting what is, is temporarily, will allow you to think, feel, and behave differently and without any resistance. This opens up new doors and new circumstances for you. I promise you, if you look back, this is exactly what happened with all that happened in your past. So call it what is versus giving up. This outlook creates feelings of empowerment, choice, calmness, content, 
and joining. Choose the reality as is because it is as is. Deal with the reality as is toward your best intention. And we'll be right back with the latest research. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM dot com. Welcome back. So this is the latest research. Which comes first, smartphone dependency or depression? New research suggests that person's reliance on his or her smartphone predicts greater loneliness and depressive symptoms, as opposed to the other way around. So young people who are hooked on their smartphones may be at an risk, increased risk for depression and loneliness, according to a new study from University of Arizona. A growing body of research has identified a link between smartphone dependency and symptoms of depression and loneliness. However, it's been unclear whether reliance on smartphones precedes those symptoms or whether the reverse is true that depressed or lonely people are more likely to become dependent on their phone. In a study of 346 older adolescents, ages 18 to 20, researcher Matthew Lapierre and his collaborative collaborators have found that smartphone dependency predicts higher reports of depressive symptoms and loneliness rather than the other way around. The main takeaway is that smartphone dependency directly predicts the later depressive symptoms. There's an issue where people are entirely too reliant on the device in terms of feeling anxious if they don't have it accessible to them. And they're using it to uh, the detriment of their day-to-day life. In a study which will be published in the Journal of Adolescent Health, Lapierre and his co-authors focused on smartphone dependency, a person's psychological reliance on the device, rather than on general smartphone use, which can actually provide benefits. Understanding the direction of the relationship between smartphone dependency and poor psychological outcomes is critical for knowing how best to address the problem. If depression and loneliness leads to smartphone dependency, we could reduce dependency by adjusting people's mental health. But if smartphone dependency precedes depression and loneliness, which is what the study found, we can reduce smartphone dependency to maintain and improve well-being. So the researchers measured smartphone dependency by asking study participants to use a four-point scale to rate a series of statements, such as, I panic when I cannot use my smartphone. Participants also answered questions designed to measure loneliness, depressive symptoms, and their daily smartphone use. They responded to the questions at the start of the study and again three to four months later. The study focused on the older adolescent, a population researchers say is important for a couple of reasons. First, they largely grew up with smartphones. Second, they're at an age and transitional stage in life where they're vulnerable to poor mental health outcomes, such as depression. It might be easier for late late adolescents to become dependent on smartphones and smartphones may have a bigger negative influence on them because they are already very vulnerable to depressive and loneliness states. Given the potential negative effects of smartphone dependency, it may be worth it for people to evaluate their relationship with their device and self-impose boundaries if necessary. The researchers said that looking for alternatives, ways to manage stress might be One helpful strategy, since other research has indicated that some people turn to their phones in an effort to relieve stress. When people feel stressed, they should use other healthy approaches to cope, like talking to a close friend, to get support, or doing some exercises or meditation. Smartphones 
are still a relatively new technology and researchers across the globe continue to study how they're affecting people's lives. LaPierre said now that researchers know that there is a link between smartphone dependency and depression and loneliness, future work should focus on better understanding why that type of a relationship exists. So one of the things is that now it has become very efficient for a lot of people to get every type of an information from their smartphone. They can get entertained, they can get the news, they can learn, they can talk to their friends. There's so many ways that they can put themselves into it. But what happens is also that when you only go to one thing, then not having that tool does create anxiety and um, many types of uh, emotions for you. So it's limiting yourself to only one tool. So you create addiction to only one tool, which at times when that tool is not available for you, it's not going to work out. But also the limitation becomes that you're not accessing different types so, and therefore you're not utilizing the best of your potential in all levels. Um, so your mind and your brain activity becomes only focused on one thing and the expansion goes away. And then when that's not available, then the depression and loneliness gets created from there. And um, a lot of people lose connectivity to just face to face, being with people, creating you know, relationships with people, enjoying the moment by moment creation of experiences and memories uh, because they're only kind of hooked to their phone. I'm sure you've all been places where uh, people go to see nature or they are in different cities and they're looking at uh, sightseeing, but they're actually connected to their phone more than being with what is. Even when we're taking pictures or videos, you cannot be with what's going on when you are doing this task and you're even utilizing your phone through it. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't. I'm just suggesting that since a lot of the research is showing, since um, most of us uh, can get hooked to things by habit very, very quickly. We lose the concept of being with what is. And when we're not with the essence of what reality is, whether it's the nature or relationships or humanity or togetherness, and we don't really read anymore this concept of you know, human to human dynamic. And it's all behind, um, you know, a phone device that we have beside us, then this phone device becomes all that there is. And if this phone device is all that there is, then that's where we're really limiting ourselves. And then those type of limitations then get us into the loneliness. So look, look, the best thing that I think the researcher said is <clears throat> evaluate your relationship with it and see if there is a way that you can balance that type of a relationship uh, with that device and bring everything else into it. So when you're in a dinner time with a friend, even if you need to use your phone for any other reason, then put it down, shut it down, put it in your purse, put it in your pocket. Don't even put it on a table so it doesn't capture you. When you're sleeping, put it in another room. If you're not you know, a doctor that you're supposed to be waking up in the middle of the night, it's okay, put it aside. And when you're studying, put it aside. These are the times where you can um, voluntarily, let's say, let go and distance yourself with that relationship and see how you can focus on one thing that you're doing and gain uh, the ultimate level of experience from it. So I'm excited to introduce to you our guest, which is Dr. Nick Egan. He's an award-winning executive coach who utilizes his deep understanding of positive psychology and Buddhist psychology to encourage personal and organizational growth. In addition to coaching, he has taught meditation techniques for more than a decade and regularly leads expeditions to destinations including Bhutan, Mongolia, Nepal, Thailand, and Tibet. Uh, Nick holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in comparative religion and a PhD in Buddhist psychology. Don't go anywhere. This is an exciting conversation we're going to have together. We'll be right back with Dr. Nick Egan.
Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the awareness integration model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, the awareness path to create the life you want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM dot com. Welcome back to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain and uh, Dr. Nick Eakin with us, the author of Shift. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dr. Fujian. Nice to be here. So, Tell us about how did you go from psychology to religion studies to Buddhist psychology to all the positive, and you brought them all together, and then now you go around the world and experience this, um, the you know the the integration of all of those, and then you brought the integration of all of those to your book shift. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a good question. Um, when I was really young, I was very interested in. I think what I would call uh, spiritual matters, just the big questions in life. So, you know, what happens when we die? How can we become truly happy? Um, things of this nature. And so I, I was really excited to start exploring some of that as I got older. And so I started meditating quite young when I was 16. I went to the local Zen um, temple here and it was fantastic. And I learned a great deal. I learned how to sit quietly for quite a while, actually. Um, and so after that, I decided to go into psychology, thinking that that was the Western analog to understanding the mind. And in my undergrad, by the time I finished, I had the choice to either go on to graduate school and pursue a master's degree in psychology or do something different. And at that time, I was a little bit jaded because the program that I was in, um, it emphasized helping sick people get well, which is completely fine. But it wasn't really what I wanted to be doing. What I wanted to be doing was helping healthy people flourish and become the best version of themselves. And so at that time, it was right around the time that um, positive psychology started becoming more and more known as a framework. Um, when Martin Seligman gave mm -hmm. his very famous talk at the um, APA in 1997. Yeah. And so anyway, I went off and did the, a master's degree in comparative religion, specifically studying Buddhist studies, thinking that I could learn more about myself and about others and about the nature of the mind itself. Um, and then that master's led the PhD and doing some work and studying in a monastery in Nepal. And then around that time, I started becoming aware that coaching uh, was starting to become a thing. Um, and it, it really wasn't until maybe a decade later that I started experiencing coaching on my own that I really fell into that. And I, I found it to be just the thing that I had always hoped that I would be doing, which is helping people become their best selves. So. Um 
my own therapist actually uh, gave me the first book, which was from, uh, I think, The Path, Path to Heart uh, with Jack mm-hmm. Canfield. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing when I started experiencing it just by reading a book. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, just by reading a book, I started having these amazing experiences. And um, that was the first time that I actually got connected to Buddhist psychology. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I had known about um, the positive psychology. And then I started going to try to look at meditations and, you know, the Zen meditation. For the life of me, Nick, I could not sit. Uh-huh. <laughs> I went into this uh, monastery where you, you, you sit for 10 minutes, you walk 10 minutes. I'm yeah. No, I'm fine with walking. But to sit for 10 minutes and then it was 20 minutes and doing that. And I was squirming. I was going everywhere and my brain just wouldn't shut down. I would get out of my body. And I finally, I sneezed so much, you know, the Roshi said, get out, get out, (laughs) bothering everybody. (laughs) And to this day, I've gone to India. I've actually, right before this work, uh, I had another guest that was here actually and was teaching me the Zen meditation again and again. So it's interesting that um, they, the meditation itself and sitting still, uh, there's this, there's a part of me as a personality that just has a lot of issues. And I've been trying this for 20, 25 years. Mm-hmm. And like meditation with other people I can do. But if I'm at home on my own, I have all of these, you know, brain um, activities that show up. And one of the things that I noticed when I'm meditating is that my brain, Nick, has this amazing visualization concept mm-hmm. and imagination that it just creates a lot of visual uh, visual stories for itself. And sure. then I get very intrigued by them. And then I kind of like fall into it before I come back and go into the state of just coming back and, you know, uh, focusing, yeah. uh, any tips for me and everybody else who's <laughs> listening or, or watching us is like, yeah, I'm just like Fujian. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's quite common. I think your experience, um, even if you've been doing it off and on for quite a while, um, it's very common that when you sit down, you get sort of taken away by thoughts. It's almost like there's a uh, waterfall or an avalanche of thoughts that you can't resist being taken away and swept up. And before you know it, so much time has gone by and then you kind of come back. Um, and there are differences in subtle physiology. So some people are more, um, more likely to have success with certain kinds of visualization. So the the main practice that I do is coming out of the Tibetan tradition, which involves a lot of visualization. So that can kind of harness that, the power of visualization that you were talking about earlier. Um, But I will tell you, my first Zen teacher, he used to say that you, to do Zen well, you had to be steamrolled. And what he meant was you needed to sit for a long, long period of time um, to kind of get over that chasm. And it's true, even when I'm, I'm teaching some of my students there is a time and, and it could be, you know, after a week, it could be after 10 years, who, who knows when it is, but it's when you kind of bridge the gap from meditation as painful to meditation as blissful or positive, or it's just something that feels good, not something that's like painful and hard and like you're pushing a boulder up a hill. Um, and what so I found is that there's hope for there me. is no, there's definitely hope. There's definitely hope. And I, I think it's, like if, for instance, you went on a retreat and instead of doing, you know, 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 40 minutes, it might be interesting to do several hours, right? And, and see what that looks like over the period of a few days and then go back to sitting 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and you might find it much more pleasurable. Got it. So I got to do one of those like three day or seven day retreats where I'm forced into it in a sense. That's yeah, what, that's what I, you mean I, by steamrolling. <laughs> that's a little bit what I mean by steamrolling. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that could, that could open up a lot of possibilities. Definitely take that into consideration. Now in shift, yeah. you show how to improve organizational leadership and personal and professional development by dismantling mental limitations and reclaiming freedom and flexibility and combining the psychology of Buddhist psychology and the positive psychology. So, um, as we go, as I went through your book, uh, one of the things you're talking about is like reclaiming your limitless potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Say more about that. Yeah. So a lot of what I'm taking from the Buddhist tradition would be considered analytical meditations, not, not necessarily just sitting down and paying attention to your breathing or even doing um, complex visualizations of mandalas, but actually thinking through narratives that we have. So the stories that we tell ourselves about what we're capable of and what we like and don't like and how we want to be in the world. And so what, I, what I'm talking about 
um, reclaiming limitless potential, I'm talking about using your mind to turn inward, to really understand the narrative that you're telling yourself, and then understand the ramifications in your current life situation. Because if you don't change that, there really is, there's not a lot of hope. You know, the, you've seen this probably with a lot of your clients where, you know, they'll get out of one bad relationship or one job. And then sure enough, three months later, it's the exact same situation. And, and the reason for that is because it's being driven by this internal narrative that they have as yes. opposed to working on the internal stuff. And then it can change quite miraculously, actually, the outer situation. One of the things that I've noticed, um, obviously, with myself and my clients as a human being, is that many times as we have created the stories, we're not um, aware that we created the story. We say the story as if that's reality, as if that's what is. And what I say is a lot of times when I'm trying, obviously, in therapy to challenge those realities, um, people become very defensive about their realities and they look at me like, what planet are you coming from? Obviously, this is the reality. And I think what I'm also hearing from you is that the conversation of watching your own narrative and getting that this narrative is something you created. This isn't really what's, you know, what might be or your approach to what is. It might not be actual, you know, like a uh, absolute that this is a reality. This is a narrative that you created and you lived by it. And I'm sensing what you, as you're saying that when you look at that narrative as yours, then you claim it, you own it, and then you also see whether it works for you or not. And that type of a detachment that comes from the Buddhist psychology allows you to detach, then therefore to work with it. That's exactly it. And I, and I think you hit the nail on the head when it comes to people not understanding that this is just a narrative or a perspective that they're bringing to a certain situation and that there might be other possible narratives or perspectives and that we need to be free to choose whichever one we would like or whichever one might be um, more productive for whatever situation. Um, people walk around, you know, I think most humans walk around thinking like, this is the, my truth, you know, capital T, this is what actually is happening. And we know, you know, from really no scientific perspective, is that the case, let alone any philosophical or spiritual perspective. Actually, all, all the traditions say actually, there's mo much more than meets the eye. Um, and there was a famous Buddhist philosopher, Chandra Kirti, and he said that all views are partial. And what he meant was that all perspectives are in some way limiting. Um, and, and then he followed it up with even this one, <laughs> meaning like even the view that all views are partial are also limited. Um, so yeah, it's an open invitation to, to deeply understand narrative and then to feel free to choose a different one that'll maybe enhance your life. And you say go beyond definition. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? So there I'm, I'm talking a little bit about interconnectedness. So when you think about def definitions, words, and the meanings that we attribute to them, by nature, they're actually limited, right? So I think if I think of myself as, let's say, just a son or just a husband, and if there is no other room for anything beyond that, then it can become a limitation in and of itself. Now, that doesn't mean that those things aren't accurate. It just means that there's more than the sum of those labels. And the same thing goes for our experience. The, the way that we label experience actually can be quite limiting, but we still have to do it to live in the world. And how we get beyond that is to loosen our grasp on those kind of labels and the limitations that come with them. So when tell me what you mean by we, what we give as labels, such as um, like if I define my emotions and say I'm scared or I'm angry, would that be a label? Or is it uh, when I look at the world and say, you know, so-and-so is this and that, or I am not good enough, or uh, what are the labels you're talking about? Yeah, but both of those are labels. I would say the, the more important one to tackle first would be the one that is connected more to the narrative. So kind of like what you were saying in the beginning, how, you know, you have a certain experience with meditation, and so you could label yourself, oh, I'm a bad meditator. That's not what you did. But a lot of people might say that. In fact, I've had plenty of clients that say that, oh, you know, I've tried meditation and I'm really a bad meditator and it'll never work and all of that. And it, of course, they have good reasons. It's based on their own experience. But there might be an entrance into another kind of story. And so that that the problem is that that story creates a limitation and it's kind of like an anchor. If, if you're telling yourself, I'm a bad meditator, for instance, it's very hard to move beyond that, whereas another kind of story might allow a greater degree of freedom. And uh, 
the other part that uh, you were talking about is reframe difficulties as opportunities. So you look at the narr narrative as is, and then when that narrative appears to be uh, going toward this is so hard, this is difficulty, why me, why this is happening to me, and you you create all of the story about it, um, there, you're saying to shift, which is the name of your book, shift. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shift those, uh, the narrative and the story you created, the outlook about difficulties to opportunities. So say more about that. Yeah, so I think the common view is when things are difficult or when there's a challenge or difficulty or, or whatever it is that you're facing that's not um, the easy kind of success that you want it to be, there's a tendency to label those things as bad or negative. But actually, there's a different way of looking at that. Um, one way is, you know, that's perhaps keeping other people from, that's reducing the competition if it's in a business sense, right? So that, that's one way I can feel very grateful for the, the barrier to entry, whatever it is. Another way to think about it more in terms of a spiritual practice is the person that's annoying or being challenging to me or, or even just downright mean. Um, they're really affording me the opportunity to practice tolerance or patience with that person and to work with these strong emotions moving forward. And the greater facility that you have working with those kind of emotions, the greater freedom that you have, and you're able to actually overcome those obstacles much, much easier uh, because they don't quite seem as real or as out there as they normally would otherwise. There's also another reframing, as I'm hearing you, uh, comes to mind, which is, um, a lot of times people look at difficulties as something I got to handle. Mm -hmm. um, and the outlook that it isn't just the matter of handling the difficulty, but also this is an opportunity for self-growth. Mm -hmm. This is this is another outlook that kind of like joins the conversation of how do I deal with this? Because not only externally I'm looking at handling it, but also internally, I'm looking at utilizing all these opportunities for my growth. So when you said, if somebody is doing something and instead of me just being frustrated and looking at how can I, you know, I'm just tolerating them in order to da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Not only we're doing that, but there's also this concept of the outlook of, oh, this is an opportunity for me to exercise my tolerance. So mm -hmm. this is another level of that dynamic that my eyes not only being looking outside to handle me and the world but now there's another camera that is looking at me in this process and looking at an inner process and to me that's also another layer of reframing mm -hmm. yeah that's exactly right sometimes i'll use an analogy with my clients um, of going to the gym and it's it's like you go to the gym and there's a heavy weight there and you're lifting the heavy weight, and it, in hopefully there's some kind of burn, some kind of physically unpleasant sensation, and that's how you actually know that you're progressing, you're getting stronger, is through through the pain of that. And so that's something that we voluntarily do. We voluntarily go to the gym and lift these heavy weights and and feel this pain. And the same thing goes for life. So we we need to lean into those kind of challenges. No, it's it would be foolish to go to the gym and and be angry with the weights for being heavy. And the same thing in life when you find challenging, annoying people or situations, it's foolish to be angry at them. There's a, uh, there's a distinct difference that comes up for me, Nick, and I would like you to respond to this specific difference, which is I think when we are going to the gym, uh, although I hate the burn and all of that, the pain, <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm labeling it directly, but... Um, I think there is also this concept of I have power and choice that if I don't like it, I'll put the weight down. Mm -hmm. I have the choice to not deal with this. Mm -hmm. But many times when it comes into our relationships with the world, like we're, you know, we're at work or mm -hmm. our mate or our in-laws or our parents or siblings or child or, you know, uh, my boss or my employee, whatever, my customer. Uh, this is another relationship which it appears that I don't have the uh, the power to just put the weight down and move along, and that's my choice. A lot of times we are caught in the situation, and my clients many times are caught in the situation that, well, I don't want this, but I can't let it go because um, 
it's in my face or they're the one I don't want it. They're the one who are coming in my life or I can't just quit. You know, what do you want me to do? Just get a divorce. You know, I can't get a divorce from my child. What do you want me to do? Just throw them out. It's they're th- 10 years old. So there's sometimes this element of powerlessness mm-hmm. that shows up and stuckness that shows up with some of the relational aspects, which is different than, you know, who we are with an object. Mm-hmm. So share with us also the concept of reframing the difficulties into opportunities uh, I love the one you said, like, you know, I'm really practicing my tolerance, but so other, uh, examples that you might have to let go of this concept of powerlessness as I have it with the situations that show up that I can't just say, okay, I'm not, I, I have the ability to let it go, but just because of my growth, I'm going to stick to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And it, I think it is qualitatively different for most people, you know, dealing with uh, an object, as you said, versus a relationship or another individual. Um, i would say a couple things. The first is that narrative you, you mentioned that is a kind of powerlessness. Like I can't, I can't do that. What I would encourage a client to do is actually explore that, you know, okay, you can't, you can't get rid of this client that you have or this customer, but what would happen if you did? And really, you know, extend that out. Like, let's just do a a thought experiment, an analytical meditation. Could you actually get rid of that person? And maybe, maybe you're going to choose not to, or maybe there are consequences that are so extreme, you don't want to accept them. But that's very different from saying like, I can't do that. It's, I, I can actually do that. There are just some consequences that I don't want to face by cutting that customer or that client out of my life, something like that. That's a, that's quite a different, um, power level within the person that's doing it. So I would encourage them first to explore that all the way to the end and then make the conscious choice. If they really can't get rid of that person or whatever, and, and they, or they, for whatever reason, choose not to, then st- you don't need to think about it anymore. Then turn completely and face to the difficult customer or client or whatever, and then work within that framework because you've already gone down this other road and you know that that's a dead end. So that right there would be an, an example of how you can reframe the narrative. But first you have to explore that narrative of like, I can't, cause that's, we, you know, that's almost never the case. Um, it's just that you don't want to accept the negative concept or the consequences the that price. go with that. The price. Exactly. You don't want to pay the price. Yeah. The other There's... thing I would say, yeah, I just really quick. I, I would say it, you know, you can't, Maybe there aren't certain things that you can set down, but we all kind of signed up for this gym called life mm-hmm. and we can't, there's no getting out of the gym called life. I, I, I've known plenty of monks and nuns that live in monasteries high in the Himalayas. And I can tell you that there is no escaping the annoying, challenging, difficult situation and or people. Yes. There, there is no way. But I, I also liked and agreed with what you said that when we go from, powerlessness and choicelessness to the concept of, well, let's really look at, I do have a choice, but there's a price to pay. Mm -hmm. I'm now willing, I'm not willing to pay this price and I'm willing to pay this price of tolerating or dealing with it or shifting my view. Then Mm -hmm. it it takes away from that kind of powerlessness. Um, And then there's also this element which comes with the meditation, um, which is the self-reflection which is, again, the two layers that you consistently look at, that one is dealing with the outside, one is dealing with the inside, and then integrating the two. Mm-hmm. Um, I love this word. It says eliminating useless ideas. I love this. But part of it is distinction of what is useless. Like, how do you first declare something useless? Because sometimes we get so bogged down with these thought process, and we're really into it. I mean, I got you know, clients and people, and there was a time in my own life that, you know, I would just, you know, in my head, like fight in, in order to win something in my own head. I declare it useless today, but Mm -hmm. that what did not appear to be useless at that time. Um, and you say embrace useless idea to embrace positive, eliminate useless idea to embrace positive solutions. Talk a little bit more about that and how to declare something useless. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I would say that um, any any idea or narrative or story that people have, it came to them or it was generated because it served a purpose at a time, right? And what happens is you get stuck in that in that same framework moving forward, and eventually you start to see, or maybe you don't see, you start to see, hopefully that there there is some limitations to how you're viewing a particular situation or person. And that's how it's through a deep, um, 
introspection that you're able to identify the uselessness and then to move beyond that. And I'll give you an example. So I have a client, um, she's, uh, one of my executive coaching clients and essentially she has become very successful and she had this narrative that she has to like do work 10 times harder than everybody and really kind of stick it to people to show, to prove how successful and how smart and how brilliant she really is. And that's actually worked for her quite, quite well over the past, you know, couple decades. Um, but what happens is once you start getting to the top and have people underneath you and you're operating in, in a different way, you have to be able to let go of that feeling and make it a little bit more collaborative and a little bit more, um, you know, connected than she had been previously. And so that it feels uncomfortable because she wasn't used to doing that. But with a little bit of practice and a little bit of identification of that old story, you can create a different kind of story that actually I don't need to prove anything to anybody. And in fact, we're all in this together and let's all rise together to this challenge. And that's that's a very different piece. But she couldn't she couldn't have seen that 20 years ago when she started. Right. Yeah. So a, a useful question would be just the straight question, is this way of thinking or feeling or acting useful for me? Like to actually directly ask that question to yourself and answer it. And if it becomes useless, then move on to the next level, right? Yeah, yeah. I think for most people, that, that would be an easy and great and direct way to do it. I think for most people, it will start with where do you feel stuck within your life? And, and then talk about that situation and then talk about the story that you're giving that, like, why, why do you feel stuck? What have you always done? What are you doing now? What does that look like? Feel like sound like that kind of thing. And then, mm -hmm. and then ask them. And when I'm doing coaching, I oftentimes will, we, even when, when I'm not face to face with them, I'll ask them to pick another spot in the room and actually physically move there and describe the situation from a totally different perspective. And maybe they even need help, you know, describe that. Imagine that you're embodying your best friend. How would they describe that situation or the Dalai Lama or whoever, you know, and mm -hmm. so you can get a lot of interesting insight by doing that kind of technique. Um, one part of your book, which is amazing and I think is important because the rate of addiction to everything is uh, rising, which is reduce addiction to urgency to increase yeah. productivity. What do you mean reduce addiction to urgency? Yeah, I, I tend to use urgency in the pejorative. So what I, I should maybe say just false urgency. And I've worked with a lot of clients um, that have uh, kind of an addiction to the feeling of importance that comes with putting out fires. So putting out fires constantly, like tons of people need me. I'm, I'm always doing these things and uh, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, I'm on my phone and oh, I got to take this call and then do that kind of stuff. Um, and then sure enough, they end up doing, there's two things, two really clear signs of being addicted to urgency. One is you feel like you're just spinning your wheels constantly. You're making no forward momentum. And the other piece is you're just, you're close to burning out. You feel so taxed and tired all the time. And you know, your, your calendar is ridiculously full so much so that things start dropping off. Um, and it's, it's hard not to be addicted to that kind of urgency because very often people that you're working with will come to you and try to get your attention with that, right? Like, ah, oh, this thing needs to happen. This thing needs to be solved right away. Or maybe you have family members that are like this too, you know, friends. Oh no, th this is terrible. Like everything's going badly. You know, will you please help me? And, and instead of allowing for the space for the other person to really be empowered to find the answers that they're looking for, we often just jump in and do it for them. Um, I have a client who d is working on this specifically. And one of the things that he's doing is um, just trying to give a, the question back to the person. Like, wh what, do you, what is it that you need to do to fix this? Or what's the real challenge for you here? Something like that. Um, and that, that can be, that just stops it in its tracks, but it's hard. You have to be willing to let go of not being the person that's solving everybody's problem all the time. And what you get in response is you get greater freedom, more actual leadership power because you're empowering others to, to do that. And you get more time and space to work on the things that actually are important. And the more you work on the important, the less there's urgency. And you also talk about practice patience to avoid frustration. Now, isn't that an oxymoron concept? Isn't that most of the people who are cre creating frustration for themselves think that they have no patience? So mm -hmm. how do you practice patience in the face of frustration in order to avoid frustration? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. This is actually a translation problem um, because in Buddhism and in Sanskrit and Tibetan, patience, we don't really have a proper English word for this, right? So in English, we say either 
the word gets translated either as patience or tolerance. And when you say to somebody like, be patient in English, usually what they're visualizing is like, oh, okay, I'm going to passively sit around and wait for things to go better like that. It's not really, that's not really what it means. And then if you practice tolerance, it also doesn't quite have the same meaning to it. Cause it's like, okay, I'm just tolerating that thing. Right. Whereas in a, a negative in a, connotation to it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. In Buddhism, it's much more like a heroic or active kind of patience. It's like when things are really hard, when I have like, people that are actively trying to challenge me or be annoying or whatever it is, whatever the negative situation is, I'm going to actively meet that with all of my awareness and all of my tools, my mental tools, my spiritual tools to be able to, to further this situation and everybody that's involved. This is what shows up for me as you say this is, um, the state of patience and, um, and tolerance, let's just call it tolerance, because I think that's what it really, even the way that we say it in the Western world as patience is really tolerance. Mm -hmm. That appears to be more that I am hooked on something inside of me that I'm right, and it should be my way. However, the world isn't acting the way I say it. So I'm just going to hold resistance to what it is. And this just creates frustration. And I, even if I have to not handle it, but I'll hold to my inner truth the way I think it's the truth until this thing passes. Mm -hmm. So that's what it comes to. I'm hearing the word patience that is you meaning and uh, and what you say from the Buddhist concept that I let go of the attachment that I have to my inner world as I say it's accurate or it is and I with everything that I have with like every cell of my body I'm really attending to what's happening outside is that what I'm hearing Yeah so that would actually be kind of the ultimate patience right is you're not, you don't really you're not really projecting any kind of wants on a situation or a person other than what is actually in front of you. So that, that is certainly something to strive for. Um, what I was talking about was a, a little bit more, um, it necessitates a reflective nature of like, okay, I'm going to try to actually meet this in a way that's positive as opposed to being frustrated, annoyed, angry, whatever. But definitely I think for many people as they're going through a spiritual path or even just, you know, a mindfulness meditation type of path, you gain more of what you're talking about, which is almost like I, I, I use the term ultimate patience. It's like there, it, you don't even need patience at that point, because if you're, if you're not projecting onto what's there in a way that you want it to be different, then you don't need to exercise patience because there's nothing to bother you. Would that be the, what you call a flow state in your book? It could be, it, it definitely could be. Yeah. That's the thing. Um, a flow state there's been a lot written about flow states and especially around meditation. That's actually what you're trying. One of the things that you're trying to achieve within meditation is by you're, you're achieving a kind of flow state simply by sitting down. And then it makes it much easier to achieve these kind of states when you're out walking around or doing something that you love. Okay. So one of the quote you say is urgency is simply a panic that you believe. Yeah, that's it's, there's a, when you're, especially in a work situation, I think that there can be this, um, there can be like a group think around urgency and creating panic. Like, ah, we, this, this thing is so terrible. We've got to just all rally, rally the troops. And it feels kind of good to be working in a team that's working on something that is so urgent and so panicky that there's a kind of, um, I don't know, there's like an emotional momentum behind it. And so then you get, addicted to that, that feeling again and again, because when you do inevitably, hopefully solve that, put out that fire, there is like a little miniature sense of power, but it's a false kind of power because all it's doing is you're waiting for the next thing to happen as opposed to like a real, a true leadership type of power would be being able to identify what's important about that situation and then empower the right people to take care of that on their own. So a little bit of uh, realization of what is attached to kind of like your ego um, in a way that holds that need for power versus uh, being in the state of flow and look at in exactly what it is that is power or what is that it gets created out there that gives you those type of choice and power and the distinction between those moving from one to a state of attachment to your ego to the next level. Yeah, that's very well said. That's exactly it. Um, you're reminding me of a, there's a saying in Tibetan, um, and it goes, it gets translated something like this, 
like it, a dog when you throw when you throw a stick for a dog the dog always chases the stick but if you throw a stick to the lion or for a lion a lion will turn around and chase the person that threw the stick mm-hmm. so it's it's like going after you don't you don't follow the shiny glimmery thing that's out there you turn inward and you look at the real the real situation that's causing whatever this the outside challenge is um what is it that you see a difference and um, and I know that you bring both element into your book shift but mm-hmm. what is the distinct difference also from the from, from the perspective of positive psychology versus the buddhist psychology yeah i think i think that as psychology has matured over the past 100 years it's coming closer and closer to buddhist understandings of the self and buddhist understandings of feeling states and all of that i mean we we've, we've seen this with the explosion of mindfulness it wasn't that long ago, you know, 20, 30 years ago, where we thought that the brain, you know, stopped forming around the age of 22 or 23. Now it's much later. And now we found that with neuroplasticity, meaning um, the things that we do can actually create different uh, pathways within the brain, that that actually never ends. And it wasn't until we had, you know, functional uh, fMRI, fMRI machines that were much more sophisticated. And so I think that those Buddhist psychology and current positive psychology are are coming closer and closer together. Now, of course, you know, there's cosmological things, there's all kinds of religious aspects of Buddhism, but I'm talking about actually like the science of the mind and human experience. And I think that there isn't there is quite a lot of overlap between the two. Um, and we'll see how it progresses in the future. So where can people find you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can go to nickeganphd.com. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. And both of, uh, if they go to uh, your website, they can find not only your book, but also uh, your retreats and um, also how to find you in order to get coaching sessions, right? Absolutely. Yep. You can contact me for coaching. We do retreats, trips, um, or just to say hello. Say more about your trips, especially since I got to go to two weeks of Uh, minimum seven days to two weeks of just sitting with somebody telling me I got to (laughs) sit. Yeah, that could be fun. Um, yeah, the trips, so I I typically will go to areas that have been touched by Tibetan Buddhism. So Mongolia, Tibet, Nepal being the primary ones, um, and, and Bhutan. So all in the, in the Himalayas. And what we do is we travel around and go to different, um, religious centers, historical centers, and there's a fair amount of coaching, a fair amount of meditation practice that goes along with it. And it's open to anybody from, you know, a, a novice meditator, somebody that's just read a couple of books, maybe is interested and or an experienced practitioner 20 plus years. And the trips offer the experience of seeing seeing what you're practicing on the walls of the temple or in the landscape or wherever it is. And there's a great deal of inspiration. And what I found is that that can create much more progress um, than just doing a static retreat somewhere. Got it. So within one minute that we have, uh, what is it that we haven't covered and you really, really want the listeners and the viewers to know about you or your book and your methodology? I think we've covered quite a lot. I would say that whether you're working with me or you or anybody else, that it's really, um, it's very valuable to, to find somebody that can act as a mirror, holding up your own patterns that you can move beyond them. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being on my show. It's a great pleasure to have you, everyone. Go get the book, Shift, from Nick, uh, Dr. Nick Egan. And for everyone who has been with us, Until next week, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Bye-bye. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matter. News, talk, and sports for the Inland Empire. AM 1490 KMET, Banning, Beaumont, Redlands. I'm Daria Albinger, Vice President Pence, setting the record straight.